डॉक्टर अलोवालिया गुड इवनिंग एंड वेलकम टू दिस इंटरव्यू विद बिजनेस स्टैंडर्ड सर वी वुड लाइक टू स्टार्ट विद योर असेसमेंट ऑफ द करंट इकोनॉमिक सिचुएशन Uh, as you saw uh, uh, over the past few months especially in the october december quarter there was there was signs of recovery across you know whatever data was being released by the government there were signs of recovery and now the third wave has hit and again there are restrictions across states so in your view how broad based was the recovery which was happening and how affected it will be by this uh, latest round of restrictions because of the omicron wave well you know we are going through uh, all over the world we are going through a highly uncertain period so it's very difficult to predict what the current omicron wave will be like many people think that uh, there will be a huge increase in the number of infections but that as has happened in other countries the peak will be reached very quickly and it will come down again in which case uh it may not be something that will affect the whole of this quarter but clearly whatever effect it has will be somewhat negative now uh i think what this means is that uh we should have a realistic assessment of what this year is going to be like i mean the national statistical office had rec- uh, assessed uh that there would be a growth rate of about uh, 9.2% but this was really based on Uh, the first two quarters it doesn't take into account what is the most recent development it certainly doesn't take into account the omicron and many other people have given somewhat lower uh, ass- assessments of growth 8.5% uh, many people have said you know that still looks reasonably good so i think i have no doubt that we can certainly claim that india saw a strong recovery from the very sharp decline the previous year i mean you know we we declined more than the rest of the world so we shouldn't be saying we are the fastest growing country what it means is although we declined more we've also recovered so i would say that there is a recovery <clears throat> but the real question is what's the momentum behind this recovery going forward and secondly although there is a recovery and this is again not just india it's true all over the world i mean the word k shaped is being popularized by the imf uh, it's k shaped in the sense that the developed countries are doing better than the developing countries and within the developing countries the more formal sectors are doing better than the less formal sectors to some extent manufacturing has done better industry manufacturing done better than services and a lot of the informal sector uh, is in the service area uh sir now uh, the upcoming budget will it is expectation of the industry as well as economists as well as uh, policy watchers like yourself there is an expectation that the government in the upcoming budget will announce policies and will will announce measures which will take forward this growth and this rebound that has happened um uh, and so as per you and since you have been a veteran of many a budget as per you what are the two to three things that the finance minister and the finance secretary and the other secretaries in north block should keep in mind while preparing the budget you know you described me as a veteran of budget so i should declare that the the first consequence of that is a realistic recognition that uh, we overstate what the impact of a budget is going to be hmm. i mean the budget has become like the jaipur lit fest it's the opportunity where everybody interested in economic issues pronounces and that's good i mean it becomes an occasion to discuss everything it's not as if the budget can address all these questions simultaneously so i think what are the big issues well issue number 1 which people will be looking at is uh, what is our macroeconomic stance going forward forget about uh, you know what it was in the past are we on a sound macroeconomic basis going forward there's been a lot of speculation on whether the budget will hit the fiscal deficit that was targeted i personally do not think that's a very important uh, issue because this is an abnormal year and frankly if uh, the finance minister were to exceed the budget deficit she could very easily explain it as long as people felt that looking forward 
she was saying and doing the right things, okay? And I think in this context, it's particularly relevant given that we don't really know what the Omicron is going to be formulated in February. The expectation was that the GDP will grow at 10.5%. They, they, they recently announced 9.2. My guess is that it may well be 8.5, given what has happened on Omicron. So, you know, if the budget deficit was supposed to be 6.8 and the uh, in an environment where GDP growth was 10.5, and if GDP growth falls significantly shorter than that, that will have an impact on revenues. So I don't think that exceeding the budget deficit for the current year should really create too much of a problem. And the implication of that uh, to me is that if there are expenditures that are being held back, I think she should actually do them. You know, I, I, I think the finance minister did a very good thing a couple of years ago, saying I want to come become transparent. I think we should do more transparency this year also. I mean, for example, take the Magnarega expenditure. You know, demand for Magnarega is very high. And it's quite possible that many state governments are so constrained because they don't have resources that they're not taking on Magnarega projects as much as they could. On those kinds of schemes would be, in my view, a good thing. Second, looking ahead, the key thing is, what are you, what are you projecting as growth? Uh, I think one of the biggest concerns that people have is that if we don't get back to a high growth path, we will not be able to handle the employment problem. I mean, the employment thing has been building up. Uh, it's not measured by how many people are unemployed because a lot of the people who got uh, thrown out of their jobs uh, took up lower quality jobs and there was also a decline in the worker participation rate. So the unemployment rate may not have increased if you look at the CMIE data. But what is happening is the volume of employment is not what it was two years ago. And yet population has increased, the labor force has increased. So we have a problem. But I don't think that this problem can be really credibly resolved without getting the growth rate back something above 7%. Now, um, I think most objective observers would say that India has the capacity. I mean, originally we were talking about double digit and 8 and 9%. That may not be feasible. But India has the capacity to grow at seven and a half, maybe even eight percent, providing certain things are done. Now, what happens here is that as soon as this is said, it becomes a general discussion on reforms. And you can announce all kinds of reforms, but most reforms take a long time before they actually begin to have an effect. So I think the most important thing is what can we do in the next year, which would have a more immediate effect? And, you know, in my view, uh, I would say that the lack of demand that everybody complains about is actually because investment has gone down. Uh, and I don't think the solution is pumping up consumption demand uh, because, you know, consumption will recover when incomes recover. And if incomes are not recovering and you are just pumping up consumption, that's somewhat artificial. I'm in favor of doing that for Magnarega type of expenditure because it's targeted as the very poorest. But I don't think we have an artificial stimulation of consumer durables and things of that kind. So basically, I think if investment has gone down next year, the important thing to do would be to have a really strong stimulus on public investment in infrastructure, because that is something that has to be done by the public sector. And we know that infrastructure is not enough. So whatever we can do, we should do more of. I mean, that's one point. Second, you know, I, I think one of the most important reforms, which has virtually universally been praised as an idea, is the GST. And, you know, for the last year, I mean, everybody seems to agree that we need to make structural changes, that the finance ministry agrees with this view. So the question is, are we going to see that structural change? The problem is you can't expect that to be announced in the budget because that has to be done in the GST Council. And there, quite frankly, 
you you're faced with a with a problem. I mean, the states are saying that look, you're not compensating us for the GST shortfall of the previous years, and secondly, that compensation is supposed to end with 2022. Okay, they will say uh, that you should extend the thing from 2022 onwards. Now, quite honestly, I think the states have been through such a difficult time. That my personal view is that as a matter of judgment, it's a good idea, if not to extend it by five years, to extend it for another three years. And the compensation should not necessarily be calculated on the basis of a 14% target growth of GDP. That's too high. Because if, if GDP is going to grow only at uh, X percent and inflation is to be kept at 4%, then the reference rate with respect to which the shortfall is calculated should be more modest, maybe somewhere between 10 and 11 percent. So a compromise on that, offering the states that, look, we will extend this for three years with this modification, but you please agree to the following changes in the structure. I think that this would be a good bargain uh, and it I don't know whether she can do it before the budget itself, but if she, even if she could, I think I would recommend announcing that I'm going to make this offer. Uh, and then it puts the pressure on the states to respond. And you can use your own uh, uh, sort of uh, ability to lobby the states to make sure that you get enough of a consensus. If we can end the next year or in the middle of the next year, bring about a structural reform in the GST, I think that would be terrific. Dr. Aluwala, you made a very interesting point that although the population has increased over the past two years, the volume of employment has not increased. Uh, and that is something that does not, that does not necessarily reflect in the CMIE data. Uh, and only if there is a sustained 7% growth can employment, can the volume of employment increase and the jobs can be created. Now, that is a long-term issue. And there are many factors there. Aren't any budget announcements enough to at least start towards that direction of creating more jobs? Because the government's plan to create more jobs and to push demand and consumption has been a massive public investment in infrastructure. That is a point that you also mentioned. Uh, and next year also, we expect a substantial increase in the capital expenditure targets for the government. Uh, now, do you think that is enough? Just an infra push is enough to create jobs or... Does the, does the budget need to announce more initiatives uh, to help job creation? And what can those initiatives be? You know, jobs are going to be created by the middle and small scale sector. I think the most important thing the government can do there is to actually make sure that the public sector banking system uh, restarts the credit cycle. And frankly, the growth of credit from the public sector banking system has been very, very low, very subdued. You know, Finance minister should make a realistic assessment of what is possible, because I think making making announcements which then simply don't fructify. I mean, frankly, if these public sector banks cannot be privatized in the current financial year, it would be a good idea to actually say so and say, look, hopefully we'll do it next year rather than making these big announcements. And, you know, it makes a big headline that this is a reform, but nothing actually happens on the ground. I would say that, you know, since the GST is in the realm of the uh, council, I don't believe, frankly, that in the direct taxes, there's much that she can do because the tax rates have been lowered. Uh, and I, I don't think there's that much uh, flexibility. Where she has flexibility, quite honestly, is in the import duty structure. I think the trend of the last three years of raising import duties has been a mistake. It has, I think the government is badly advised on this. Now, you know, globally also, we need to integrate with the rest of Asia. In fact, I would be delighted if she would actually make a policy statement on customs duties. What is the government's statement? What is the government's policy on uh, customs duties? Is raising duties viewed as a way of promoting Indian industry or no? Uh, it shouldn't be in my view. Uh, and, you know, if you make that clear statement, at least you'll stop further lobbying. I think there are, it would be great to make a list of items where our duty rates are much above those 
of Southeast Asia and simply lower them, giving a signal that this is the direction that we want to go. Uh, sir, what are the sectors or sections of the demographic? Or the or individual the, sectors? Sectors or the sections of the demographic that you would like the budget to focus on and give pay special attention to? You know, I don't believe that the budget should be targeting sectors or demographies. I mean, that is a sort of a micromanagement. To get the macro balancing right, and I think from the macro balancing point of view, I think the most important thing is to put enough, do enough things that will get growth going rather than targeting one group or the other. And as far as demographies is concerned, again, I don't think the budget is the instrument for doing anything of that kind. The budget's role there really should be to make sure that, um, I would say, expenditure on health uh, is something that we need to think seriously about. In my view, uh, look, the, the, the sectors that have done very well are not sectors for which budget pronouncements were made. It's the sectors that don't do well for which budget pronouncements are made and they continue not to do well. So I don't think that that's really the way to go. Sir, uh, and you did touch upon this in an earlier question about, uh, you know, when you spoke about Narega, but leaving aside Narega, uh, now there are three waves of the COVID-19 pandemic. We are in the third wave and incomes have come down, jobs have been lost, uh, consumption levels have come down. And uh, at such a stage, now while many economists and many people have sort of advised for it, do you think that a temporary targeted direct income support scheme is something that can help with the consumption and with household incomes to some extent. You think? Well, we already have a temporary target at the PM Kisan uh, for the rural areas. We have that. We have Magnarega, which gives a lot of income support uh, to those who really need it. I don't believe that major changes like income support schemes should be should be launched in the middle of an emergency which by definition is temporary. In fact, the resource constraints under which the finance minister has to work are very severe and new schemes take more than a year to get designed and function. This was a great advantage of Magna Rega that it already existed. It had been working for several years and it was very easy to say, all right, instead of 100 days, you're allowed 150 days. You could even say that uh, we're raising the wage temporarily. But if you start a new employment or a direct cash transfer scheme, the leakages will be massive. To my mind, more expenditure in infrastructure will stimulate construction. And I think the stimulus to construction is very desirable. Uh, it will generate a lot of employment, which will help. <clears throat> Personally, I think if they were to do the GST restructuring, one of the obvious things that should be done is to lower the, the GST rate on cement. You know, the GST rate on cement is 28%. Now, cement is not a final luxury consumer good. I mean, uh, cement is actually, every factory uses it, every house uses it. You should have a much lower rate. Uh, but again, that's something can only be done in the GST council. Actually, it would be worthwhile for the finance minister to say that it is not in my power to do it, but I'm going to propose to the GST council, you know, the problem with the present rate structure, 50% of the commodities you consume are exempted. Now, this is just wrong. I mean, you know, maybe that 50% should be made 25%. Other commodities should bear a normal tax, okay? Uh, and, and the high-end tax rates should be lowered, and that's how you can, instead of having four basic tax rates, 5%, 12%, 18%, 28%. You should just go to a 12% and a 15% or something like that. Sir, thank you so much. Um, Dr. Anubhaya, thank you so much. If you like this video, share it and subscribe to Business Standard. For more news, views and insights, log on to www.business-standard.com. Do also follow us on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Telegram and LinkedIn.